Here I have a single phase induction motor which I have removed from a washing machine. I'm going to disable this motor partially in order to demonstrate a principle that I brought up in the last episode. Uh, if you haven't seen the video just previous to this one, it's going to be really important that you watch that first. I explained how induction motors work and so I'm going to put a link in the description. Uh, you can watch that, come back, and then this one you should be able to flow right into this one. At the end of that video, I told you that single phase induction motors work on the same principle of three phase motors, except there's a problem. The single phase motor doesn't actually produce a rotating magnetic field. It has an oscillating magnetic field, one that just flips top and bottom. And that's not enough to get the motor to rotate. In fact, if you have a force going this way and then just a millisecond later, one going in exactly the opposite direction, they sort of cancel each other out and there's no torque produced on the rotor. What we need is a spinning magnetic field. Now, uh, to demonstrate this, I'm going to uh, show you what happens when a single phase motor is only supplied with single phase. As you can see, it's humming, so we know something is happening, but it's not actually rotating. But here's the interesting thing. Now there, you just saw me give it a kick to the right, and it was able to spin. In fact, it continued to spin on its own, and the direction doesn't matter. So if you think about it for a moment, this makes sense. We have a, a magnetic field that's pulsating top and bottom. We give the rotor some momentum in one direction. So now it's rotating and the magnetic field is pulsing and hitting the rotor as it goes by. That pulsing magnetic field is enough to sort of simulate the rotating magnetic field that we had before. The torque that's produced by a single phase motor is not nearly as smooth as that of a three phase motor. In fact, it's pulsating just like the magnetic field is, which replicates how often uh, there's a nudge or force pushing on the shaft. Spinning the rotor is not very practical, right? How do we get this thing to spin on its own? What we want to do is replicate what we have with a three phase motor with the single phase supply that we have available and I'll show you how engineers do this. So what we have here is another diagram for you. This is a two pole motor. It's got one winding but that one winding has a north and a south pole and therefore it's a two pole motor. Over here you see another set of windings but this one is a starter winding and the starter winding is designed to do primarily what you saw me do manually just a moment ago. It gives the motor a kick start. We discussed in the last video that if you hook both of these up to single phase supply, they will be completely in phase. They will fire at the same time. It means they'll both be, uh, you know, what alternating current is positive for a little while and then negative. In this case, they'll both be fully positive and fully negative at the same time. And that won't give you a rotating magnetic field. What we need to do is somehow simulate the three phase motor by shifting one of these out of phase a little bit. And there's some devices that you can use in order to accomplish this. The first one is a start capacitor. A capacitor is very similar to a battery in that it has a, a potential across the two terminals and it stores a charge. If you hook this up, it will discharge just like a battery except capacitors discharge very rapidly. So the symbol for a start capacitor looks like this. Uh, at least the ones that we're interested in. There are star capacitors that have a symbol that looks like this. And these star, they usually have a plus symbol as well. That just denotes which direction the current is designed to flow through them. They're polarized and so if you hook them up backwards, uh, you'll have a bad day. Now, uh, but we'll hook up a non-polarized capacitor and that's what I have from my washing machine motor. I'll let you see it function here in just a moment. When we add our start capacitor, that causes the starter winding to be just slightly ahead of the run winding as far as uh, current flowing through it. That slight shift in the current flow through the start winding will give us that starting kick that we need to get that rotor spinning. Now the starter winding is not meant to run for very long. While there are capacitors that are designed to run continuously with the motor, 
most of the time you have a start capacitor here which is only designed to be powered for just a few seconds or, or even really just a second or so. Uh, another thing to note about the starter winding is the wire is usually much thinner and this is one of the ways you can identify the start winding compared to the run winding. The starter winding will have a much higher resistance because of the fact that it's got a much thinner wire. But if you have a thin wire and you keep it and you run that the full time the motor is running, that wire will get very hot. It's like a light bulb at this point. It's heating up and that can damage the insulation in your motor. So we need a way of turning this guy off. There are two ways to approach this. One, you could put like a momentary switch and you guys have probably seen that before. It's a switch where you have to push it and hold it to get the motor to start. And then when you let go, in fact, many dryers are like that. You push it and you hold it. And when you let go, the motor is running. And um, that momentary switch is across the start winding. That gets everything kicked over. And then you can, when you let go, the starter winding is disconnected. Another option would be to use a centrifugal switch. So I'm just gonna draw a little switch in here. And this is a very common method used in induction motors, the centrifugal switch. So let's, uh, let me show you this guy in action and then I'll show you the centrifugal switch. All right, we've got our capacitor wired back up. Now, I want you to notice the clicking sound. Let's try that again. You heard one at startup, and there is another one. That's the centrifugal switch opening and closing in this motor. Okay, so you can just barely see that there's a mechanism on the shaft right there that I'm pushing on. And I'm gonna show you another one that you can see better here in just a moment. But it's mounted on the shaft. And let me get my cut open motor for you. So here's another single phase induction motor and this is the centrifugal switch. You'll see that there's a spring here and weights. So the spring is what keeps the switch engaged and what I mean by that is in the position it's in now, this little white tab that you can see down here is in the closed position so you have a complete circuit for your starter winding. When the stator is energized, this guy will begin the spin and these weights will fling out, which is why it has this name, centrifugal switch. These weights will fling out like this and you notice that the white contact lifts off. I mean, this is really ingenious. It does, you don't have to touch the shaft. You don't have to worry about holding a button. You don't have to know, worry about how long to hold the button. When the motor reaches a predetermined speed, which is determined by the size of your weights and your spring here, this will fling open, your starter winding is disengaged, and the motor runs, making it completely automated. Phenomenal engineering there. Another one that I wanna show you, which I think is really ingenious, and that's the shaded pole motor. So what you're looking at here is just this little tiny fan that I took out of a microwave. Let's power it on for you real quick. Gonna take this off so you can see it better. So what we have here is an induction motor with this little copper band wrapped around the corner. Now, something I haven't told you up until now, though I've alluded to it, and that is um, the magnetic field, the flux lines, which is also a term you'll hear, pass through iron much better than it does through the air. And this is why the core is always made of iron like this because it simply transmits that magnetic field much better than the air does. When you have a magnetic field produced by this coil, most of it will be concentrated in this iron here. Uh, we've got AC current flowing through here. It's pulsing just like the other one. So how do we get it to rotate? Whoever came up with this is simply amazing. Check this out. Notice where the coils are. In the first video, I told you that when a magnetic field passes a conductor, like this copper coil, that copper coil has a current induced in it, and that produces a magnetic field, which opposes the magnetic field that's passing by. 
We could see that physically the magnet fell very slowly through the tube. That let us know that there was a force pushing back in the opposite direction that the magnet was trying to fall. Well, they've done the same thing with this. They've built in a slight phase shift in the iron. And the way it works is this guy will be induced with the north and the south pole. And we'll just say at one instant, this side is north and this side is south. And the, the magnetic field is flowing uh, through the iron like so. Coming out of this side, going up and flowing through the uh, iron over to the side, to south. Well, along the way, some of it is passing through here and some of it is trying to pass through here. But when that magnetic field comes up and hits this copper coil, it becomes an electromagnet. The copper is resisting changes in his magnetic field, which causes the magnetic field up here to be a little bit slower than the one down here. And in effect, what you have is a North Pole hitting this side and just a fraction of a second later, the North Pole hits this side and you get a rotating magnetic field. It's a little torque there. It's really ingenious. The same thing's happening on the other side, as you can see. Now, you can't produce a lot of power like this, and this is, the only, this is why you see something like this uh, only in little fans, because the starting torque is very low. At the beginning, it takes almost no energy to get the fan moving, and then once it's up to speed, then it's just like our single phase induction motor. Now, it's got its own momentum helping it to fly around and catch that next pulse to keep it spinning. Okay, so it looks like next we got our question and answer video coming up. Uh, if you would, scroll down to the comments, let me know what your questions are, and I will try to answer as many questions as I can in that next video. If I've made any mistakes or errors in this video, I will add some notes to the description, so be sure to check that and see if uh, I've omitted anything important or just was simply mistaken about something, uh, you know, I can make mistakes too. I'm going to put the playlist right here on the screen for you. So if you are falling into the middle of this series, you can click on that link and it'll take you to the playlist so that you can watch all these videos in order. If you're not a subscriber, I'd love to welcome you to my little community here. Just hit the subscribe button down here. And until then, I'll see you guys next time.